Uh, oh, ooh. our next speaker will be Amar, and Amar, she would tell us something very, very important, which is, hello. So yeah, she's going to tell us about uh, hiring. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're enjoying EuroPython so far, and now it's time for Hiring Demystified. Before we start, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mar Bartolomé. Nice to meet you all. And as you can see, I know my way around Pythons. But aside from real snakes, I've been working as a software engineer for more than a decade, mostly doing web development in startups uh, in Malaga and London. And I currently work as a remote freelancer. But in the later years of my career, I also got involved in engineering hiring. So today I'm here to tell you all I've learned after tons of trial and error. And it all started when I was working at a very small startup, and at some point we needed to grow the team, but none of us had much idea how to do it. But we've all experienced doses of interviews as candidates, so we knew the drill. So we just started imitating what everyone else was doing. And we put together a little process, which was we sent a take-home project for the candidate to do at their own pace, and then Upon a satisfactory review, we would invite the candidate over for an actual interview. But it was harder than expected. We struggled finding candidates, and the solutions that we got back from the take-home project were quite bad in most cases. Few people made it to the interview, and the, most, the, the hires that we managed to do were very junior, and we had to make use of expensive contractors to fill our development needs temporarily. And one day we made a big mistake and invited a candidate over for an interview, even when his take home project was a disaster. But surprisingly, when he came over and had the actual interview, he was pretty okay. I even recommended hiring him. And that moment was when I started questioning everything. Are hiring practices actually rational? Do they work? Or are we just mindlessly following a cargo cult? The situation reminds me of these experiments with monkeys and a ladder. And it goes like this. Uh, some scientists put a set of five monkeys on a cage. And then uh, when they attempt to get a banana on top of some stairs, the scientists spray them with some water. So they learn not to touch those bananas. But then the scientists uh, replace one of the monkeys with a new monkey, which tries to climb for the bananas. But the other monkeys knows what's coming, so they kick the new monkey down. And eventually, they replace all the original monkeys by new monkeys. And they all learn the same behavior of not letting anyone climb for the bananas, but none of them is actually aware of the reason. And I think the same thing has happened to engineering hiring. We're all following the same rituals without questioning why. When you ask people, however, most will give you some reasons. For example, they will tell you, we test people because we want to hire the best. And so they see testing as an ordeal that mortals have to pass in order to prove themselves worthy of joining their ranks. But you know what that reminds me of? Have you ever seen this show? It's like a very hard obstacle course that people need to complete in order to prove themselves the ultimate ninja warrior. And every single participant on it looks like they could star an action movie. And yet, most of them fail along the way because it's so easy to make a slip. So there's a huge luck factor involved. And I think engineering hiring has turned into the same thing. Our hiring process is so complex that for no reason other than luck, you may slip. And that's okay for TV entertainment, but I really think it's not the best strategy in real life. But of course, the cult followers have a good reason for this as well. They will tell you, yes, we know we're throwing away tons of good candidates, but it's the price to pay to avoid false positives. And by false positive, they mean someone who might look good on paper, but on reality is not. And people are so terrified at making a mistake when hiring that they think a very complex hiring process will filter those out for sure. And it's a reassuring thought, but unfortunately, I think it's incredibly naive too, because we're humans. And if there's something sure about humans is that we'll make mistakes no matter what. 
And here's another fact about humans. We're multifaceted and not just mindless coding machines. And that's actually great because we come with a lot of soft skills that really make a difference when it comes to be the best at work. But a different set of soft skills, however, will make people shine at interviews, even when you're not explicitly testing for them. There is, of course, some overlap with the two sets of skills, and this is the reason our testing kind of works. Often, people who are good at interviews are smart, and smart people are often good developers, too. Different hiring processes might make the overlap be better or worse, but be aware that it will be impossible to have a perfect match of the two circles. But it works for Google, I hear people say. And I really can't argue with that because after all, it's the giant tech companies of Silicon Valley who actually invented and popularized the hiring practices that we all now blindly follow. And we follow because they are our gods and we want to be like them. But what works for them doesn't necessarily work for you because you're likely very different kinds of companies. For example, these companies have an oversupply of candidates coming to their doors and they need to actually filter most of them out. I'm pretty sure that many of you listening to this talk have applied to a big tech company at some point. I have at least. These tech giants are also loaded. They have tons of money, employees, and resources that they can dedicate to hiring without making a dent in the rest of the business. And I very much doubt that this is the case for your company. And they have also specialized in hunting for a very specific type of candidate, a fresh graduate from an elite US university. Their hiring process is designed to be very exam-like and algorithm-focused because this is what the kids at uni feel comfortable with. But even for them, the process is not perfect. This is a tweet from the creator of Homebrew, the package manager for macOS. Every developer with a Mac is using his software, including most Google employees. So I am pretty sure that Google would want him on their ranks. And yet, when he tried to interview there, he failed. And personally, I think that's Google's loss. OK, so then what? What is the best way to do hiring? I would say like with the most complex things, there's no one true way to do it. After all, different companies have different needs and different candidates also respond differently to different processes. The key, I think, is balance. A good hiring process should strike a good balance between effort invested and quality of hires. I'm not saying that all of our practices are bad, but applying them mindlessly and discarding most candidates is, is really wasteful, both for the companies and for the candidates themselves. Your company is likely not sitting on a mountain of gold like Google is, so you need to be smarter and more efficient. If we want to hire efficiently, we need to be realistic about both our company needs and the characteristics of the developer market out there. Like I said before, not all companies have the same needs and not all developers are hired equally. For example, most companies really want to get a hold of senior developers, and for a good reason, because they are, the, they are the best bank for your buck. But guess what? They are also more difficult to hire. There's less supply of them and more demand. So you're going to have a hard time snatching them, and you can make it even harder if you make them go through a difficult and long hiring process. But the good news is that perhaps you don't need that many of them. Most companies do well with a small amount of mentors and then a bigger amount of horsepower. And that's where mid-level developers shine. People with some experience which know how to code and can work with minimal supervisions, but they are more abundant and easier to hire. And then there's juniors. They are cheap and easy to hire, but no matter how smart they are, they need at least some amount of supervision and guidance, so I don't recommend making them the bulk of your workforce. In the long run, however, they can be a valuable investment if you manage to keep them with you and set them on a progression path. After you figure out some realistic needs, the next step is to adapt your process accordingly. Testing is like clothes. It works better when it's tailored to fit different kinds of people. If you do a one-size-fits-all, the same test for everybody, you're only going to get one type of person, and what we want instead is a healthy balance. For example, it's okay for a junior straight out of uni to pair on implementing a simple algorithm, 
they often come with no experience at all, and you want to make sure they at least know the very basics of coding. But for seniors, on the other hand, you want to keep testing to the minimum possible in order not to scare them off. If you must, I feel it's okay to discuss about higher level topics regarding architecture or tech stacks. And some whiteboarding in this context is also acceptable, but algorithms or quiz questions or take home projects I find are even insulting at this level. They make you look like you don't trust that the candidate is experienced. And for those in between, you could mix and match several tactics, but always keeping them sensible. Something that we always should keep in mind is that hiring goes both ways. You're not just selecting people. People are also selecting you. So the higher you go up the seniority ladder, the more you need to relax the, relax the friction and switch from a buying mindset to a selling mindset. It can be OK for a junior to have to prove that they are worth your time. But for seniors, it's the other way around. You need to prove to them that your company is worth their time. So don't waste their time. And at every stage, I think it's important to proceed with respect and trust for the applicant and try to keep the process as relaxed and pleasant as possible. In this aspect, I like to consider hiring less similar to an exam and more similar to dating. The point is not for people to prove their knowledge or their intelligence in a formal way. The point is for both the candidate and the company to get to know each other a bit better before they embark on a longer term relationship. An exam makes you nervous and alert, whereas a date is pleasant and relaxed. And I believe hiring should be like this too. An exam is unilateral. One party makes all the rules and decides all the results. On a date, both parties participate equally. And as we've seen, hiring goes both ways. A date is also informal and imperfect. You can't expect it will give you a full picture of the personality of the other person, just a feeling. With hiring, you really can't expect more than this either, no matter the process that you're following. Another way to put it, we're all about agile in software development, right? Well, I think the same agile principles can be applied to hiring almost word by word. We should value individuals and interactions over an inflexible hiring process, responding to change over following a plan, collaborating with the candidate over one-sided approaches, and always remember that no matter how much testing you do, the only real way of knowing how someone is gonna work is actually working with them. We should value making candidates into workers as soon as possible over comprehensive testing. Okay, so far I've given you some general guidelines, but I think you could do with something more specific. So during the rest of the conference, we're gonna be looking at recipes from Mars Tech Hiring Cookbook where we will go over some well-known techniques and discuss their appropriate usages. Let's start with job postings, since they are the very first step in the hiring process, and an extremely important one, since a job posting is going to determine the pipeline of candidates that you get. So you want to craft it with care. Most people write job specs that honestly read like a letter to Santa. They describe the most perfect candidate that they can think of. It must be super experienced and know all the technologies we run in the house and then some more and live and breathe code, blah, 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 blah. And then they cry when only overconfident juniors apply. Look at this one, for example. Let's see what exactly is wrong with it. Well, first, it's very unrealistic while too specific at the same time. I mean, 10 years of experience with Python 3, has it even been around that long? And then a long list of buzzwords and also knowing about ops and front end too. Really, very few people are going to be a perfect match for this. If we get any applicants, they are going to be just the confident ones among the partial matches. And on top of that, it's written in a somewhat immature manner. It has a nonsensical job title. It's bragging about the startup being a disruptive unicorn with a top class team and using terms like web scale. What does that even mean? When an offer looks like it's written by kids, only kids are going to apply to it. And lastly, it's a bit opaque. It asks too much from the candidate, but tells us very little about the company. Compare that with this reworked version. I now explicitly separated a description 
of the company stack in the first paragraph versus the minimum requirements in the second one. By doing so, the requirements are now much more realistic, while at the same time, the spec is a lot more revealing for the candidate too. And giving them a hint of what kind of systems they are going to be working around, even if they turn out not to be involved with some of them, like the ops or the front end. We're doing two-way communication, even when we're not directly talking to anyone. We're not just asking, we're also telling. My requirements are now not only realistic, I made them as broad as possible in order to cast a wide net and not miss out on candidates. I'm not asking for specifics such as Python 3 or Django. I'm just okay with people knowing any version of Python and web development on any framework. I also removed all the nonsensical language so that the offer looks a bit more serious and written by adults. It doesn't need to be super formal. It's clear that it's still for a startup and I'm still requiring people to be comfortable in a fast-paced environment, but I can do so while talking like a normal person. I'm also including a clear salary band. This is beneficial for everyone. Being explicit about salary from the very start saves time and effort to both parties and denotes trust and transparency from the company side. After we get some candidates on the pipeline, it's time to test them. And the first thing that companies always think of is algorithms. You know, traversing trees and graphs, list sorting, prime numbers, etc. Companies love testing with algorithms because they are the perfect exam material. Small, contained, easy to review and grade. There's even platforms that you can subscribe to that automate the whole process for you. But on the other hand, candidates usually hate them because they are very detached from regular engineering work and are often too abstract or difficult to reason about. The only way to get better at them is by doing explicit practice. As a hiring tool, I think they are okay for testing juniors, especially if they come fresh from university and have no other coding experience. Algorithms is what they are going to feel more familiar and uncomfortable with. But once people have some real coding experience, there are better ways to test them. I'd rather pair with the candidate so I can clarify concepts or answer questions or simply just give some reassurance rather than leave them alone with the problem. When pairing, you can also see the thought process of the candidate, which might make sense, even if they fail to complete the exercise. The worst are, in my opinion, the automated test platforms. They are very cold and frustrating for candidates. The tight timing makes people nervous, and they usually give you very little feedback or no feedback at all when you get the solution wrong. I would not use them in any case. I prefer doing them on a laptop rather than on a whiteboard, and I consider it's totally okay to let people Google stuff, like if they need to check on some syntax or library functions. When you pair with them, it's trivial to control what's fair Googling material. As an alternative to abstract algorithms for hiring juniors, I prefer to use simpler programs that are easier to reason about. For example, a calculator or a fifth bus rather than a binary tree inversion. The goal, in the end, is not to test the intelligence of the candidate or if it can come up with clever solutions. The goal is to see if the candidate, in this case a junior, is familiar enough with the basic building blocks of coding, so we will not have to teach those on the job. And then, for candidates with a bit more experience, take-home projects are another popular hands-off hiring tactic. We send the candidate the spec of a bigger project for them to solve at home at their own pace. For example, build a Django app that implements a to-do list or a tic-tac-toe game API with persistence. They have some advantages over algorithms. For starts, they are more similar to actual development work, so they are easier to reason about for candidates. Since there's no time pressure or a person looking over your shoulder, they make people less nervous. Introvert people in particular prefer this type of testing over others. Since they are a bit more complex, they can also give you a closer feeling of the applicant coding abilities. However, if you're gonna use them, it's important to craft them with care. Since they are very detached, it's easy to lose the two-way communication that you want from any test. And then the test might become a total pain for both sides. First and most important, beware of the scope. I think it's unfair to require too much of the candidate's time. If they're looking for a job, they're not just testing for your company, but for others as well. And it's probable that they are also working their full-time job 
or perhaps they need the time to go to the gym or take care of kids. Free time is a luxury that not many people have, so be sensible. If you're not, you're going to lose the candidates who lack the time, and those are usually the best and more experienced ones. A sensible scope would perhaps be an hour or two. However, be aware that it's very easy to underestimate the time that it takes to complete. For example, I don't start a blank Django project every day, so simply having to go through the docs to remember how to set it up, and then installing a database, and a virtual M and the GitHub repo, it might take me as much as an hour just for that. I strongly recommend that you eat your own dog food and user test the challenge with yourself and other company team members first. See how long it takes them to complete it and identify any points that they find frustrating or confusing, and then adapt accordingly. Try to do your best efforts to keep the two-sided communication, even when the test is asynchronous. Be extremely clear with the spec and requirements. For example, don't just say implement blackjack and assume people know the rules because there are also many variants. Describe the rules in your spec. Overcommunicating is preferable to the alternative. Reviewing uh, can also be tricky, since unlike a pairing exercise, you're not aware of the thought process of the candidate. I find the review so much easier and fairer to do when you have the candidate's feedback to explain their approach and decisions. This could be done at a follow-up interview or via GitHub code review comments. The best way to do a take-home project, in my opinion, is to craft a stop with a partially created application where the candidate just needs to fill in the blanks. For example, add a new feature or fix some intentionally placed bugs. This way, you take most of the ground work from them and the homework becomes much more contained. It's also valuable to see how people adapt to an existing code base, which is exactly what they are going to be doing if they join your company. It's becoming popular for companies to attempt to make their testing more similar to reality by giving candidates a real-world problem rather than just a toy exercise. It's a, this approach can work with any type of challenge. You can do it on a pairing exercise or on a take-home problem or even whiteboarding. It can be effective when used right, but it's also easy to go wrong with it. The most important thing to be aware of is asymmetry. Especially if you're picking a problem from your own company, you have tons more context on it than the candidate, so it's normal for the candidate to be a bit clueless and need extra guidance from your part. If communication during the test is asynchronous, like on a take-home project, it can further accentuate the asymmetry. A test I like, for example, is picking a simple ticket from your real backlog and then pair on it with the candidate for an hour, even if you have to leave the ticket unfinished. What? Um, yeah, you have to provide the candidate with a machine already set up with the necessary environment so you can go straight to coding. A problem I really dislike, uh, on the opposite hand, is picking your company's hardest problem and then letting the candidate, the, the candidate figure out a solution. It's extremely unfair even when pairing with the candidate. The context asymmetry is abysmal. You've had plenty of time and a full team of engineers to reach a solution while the candidate has to come up with something on the spot out of the blue. So a few candidates will have satisfactory answers. And now face-to-face -face interviewing, which I think is hands down the minimum viable interview. All other challenges are optional and arguably they can even be counterproductive, but you always need a face-to-face -face talk. You can do it on site or you can do it on video conference, but you'll need to do it for every type of candidate. Think about it. In most other industries, this is the only interviewing they do, and they're fine. Remember when we said that hiring should be more like dating and less like exams? Well, a face-to-face -face interview is the more datey and less examy of the hiring tactics, so in my opinion, is the one that gives the best results with minimal effort. During a face-to-face, -face, I prefer to discuss open-ended opinions rather than doing quiz questions where you expect a right or wrong answer. For example, you could compare the tech stacks at your company and the candidate's previous company and discuss the pros and cons of any differences. You could also ask for preferences and opinions on any topic around tech that the candidate is familiar with. 
like the Python language itself or preferences in ecosystem tools, or what do they think about testing or code reviews or Git branching, etc. If they did any prior test challenges, like a take-home project, you could discuss or review those here. You could ask them what they think about the challenge, why did they choose that approach for solving, or even if there was any pain points that they would change. And this also serves as very useful feedback to adapt your testing. And if they have any personal side projects, you can ask them to tell you more about it. In short, just keep an informal discussion on geeky topics. Even when the chat is very unstructured like this, it's normally easy to tell how knowledgeable and experienced the candidate is from their answers. Compare this to explicitly asking quiz questions, like for example, what's the difference between STR and Unicode, or what happens when you enter a URL on a browser, or how does a garbage collector work? Quiz questions like this have the disadvantage of making people nervous and alert, even when they know the answer, and we want to avoid this. Also, unless they are very universal, it's easy to pick questions about a topic that is too low level or too specific, and then the candidate hasn't been in touch with it in a long time and they don't know the answer on the spot. But if they were working, they could easily figure it out by Googling. A very important point with face-to-face -face is to try to make the candidate as comfortable and relaxed as possible. There's a relatively high share of introverts or people with low confidence among developers, and they usually get nervous and blank out during in-person interviewing. This makes them look like bad candidates when in reality they are not. And because of that, they are usually overlooked by other companies, so there's good hidden gems there, and you really don't want to miss out on these candidates. Some tactics for making people relax are, for example, to explicitly reassure them that there are no right or wrong answers, to try to make it a dialogue more than an interview, try to talk and share as much as they do, because when you open up, it will motivate them to share too. Also pick icebreaker questions or topics where it's easy to come up with a response, but then let the conversation flow to different places. For example, a question like, what stack are you currently using, has a very clear and immediate answer, but then lots of opinionated discussion can follow. Whereas something like, what was your greatest achievement in your last company, totally blanks people out. Like we've seen before, testing, no matter how well designed, is always imperfect because of the mismatch of the soft skills that make you proficient at testing versus working on a team. And as such, the best way to test people is by definition to directly put them on the same job that they would be doing when hired, like a try before you buy. This kind of testing also goes both ways. The candidate gets a feeling of what it's like to work at the company. The problem is take testing like this is a lot more involved than other methods for both parties. So it's obviously not scalable to apply to every candidate that comes into your pipeline. But combined with a good face-to-face -face interview, you could use it instead of an extensive process of coding challenges. It works particularly well for senior people who can quickly demonstrate productivity once at work, but have low tolerance for coding challenges. This also aligns with our agile hiring principle, working people over comprehensive testing. There are several ways to do it, and in fact, you probably are already doing it without realizing it. If in your company you do a probation period for new hires, then you are effectively testing them on the job. A probation period is a period of a few months where either party, the company or the worker, has the right to finish the contract without any notice of consequence. Some companies go a bit more explicit and offer instead a short paid contract of a week or two before offering a definitive hire. This has a lower compromise level than the notice period, but it might not work for everyone. For example, it's not acceptable for a candidate who is still working a full-time job at a different company, as they won't have the time to spare, plus their current contract might limit them to legally be working elsewhere. The lighter option, which might suit these candidates, is to do a full day at the office instead. This requires the candidate to take a day off their current workplace, but in return they get to experience firsthand what working at your company feels like. They get to know the team, and they get a glimpse at the project that they will be working on. Some candidates value this a lot. As a company, however, you don't get such a high return as you would expect, because you can't expect people to be productive or show their full potential in a single day. 
If you do this kind of test, it will help to have a fast and, and efficient onboarding process or provide the candidate with a preset up laptop and environment so they can get direct to coding. And of course, they will need full guidance and pairing from a team member along the full day. Remember though, different candidates have different preferences. Some people loathe tech challenges and would take the short contract instead of testing anytime, even if it means leaving their current job. Others, however, might not be able to afford it in time and money and would like more traditional testing instead. I really like it when the company lets the candidate choose. We can do a technical challenge or a short contract. Your call. Sometimes there comes a candidate to your pipeline with tons to show. They may be regular open source contributors or have pet projects or keep a blog or podcast or do conference talks. When this is the case, it's you who need to do the homework and not them. They are already giving you a lot of stuff to review, so don't ask them for more. No need to give them any more challenges. They're also often great candidates, so don't scare them off. When someone comes with their own material like this, it's a great chance to use it as a topic for discussion during the face-to-face -face interview. People are usually very excited to talk about their personal projects. As an exercise, you could even ask them to show you around the code of one of their projects, which is an easy way to review not just the way they code, but also how they communicate. And for our last recipe, everyone's biggest threat. What can we do if we get a bad hire? Remember, as I said before, you will get them from time to time, no matter the process that you're using. But don't panic. Failing is a part of life too, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a drama. For everyone's interests, try to act as soon as possible when you identify a bad hire. I don't mean kicking someone out on their second day at the least suspicion, but once you're sure things are not working out, act sooner rather than later, because the sooner you act, the less painful it will be for everyone. The first course of action in the case of minor problems is to give some feedback and a warning to the person along with a second chance to improve any issues. But however, sometimes there's no other way than to let the candidate go. No one likes firing people. It's a tense and violent situation and a huge setback for both sides who have to go back into looking for a new job or a new candidate. However, there are ways to make the process a bit smoother and park with the fire person in good ways. It's important to always give honest feedback, even when the feedback is harsh. There's nothing more frustrating than being let go and not knowing why. And you can also try to help with impossible to mend the fabric of reality. You gave the candidate a job and now are taking it away. So in order to restore the balance of the universe, why not help them in finding a new one? For example, you could give the five person our small economic compensation, say a week or a month of salary, to help them pay the bills while they'll search for a new role. But you could even go as far as helping them find the job, for example, by circulating them across your network if you think that they could fit well on a team different than yours. Even when you account for all the costs of a bad hire, if you keep them just for a short time, the cost is definitely cheaper than the search for a perfect hire during a long time. Consider that you're saving the time invested in hiring by your team members, the money spent on recruiters and temporary contractors, and all of the features that are piling in your backlog with no one to do them. So don't be afraid to fail, but when you do, try to fail fast. And we're reaching the end of the presentation now, but before we go, let me give you some final tips on the overall hiring process. I think the process should have as few steps as possible. I insist, even if you do just a face-to-face -face interview, that's fine, that's the minimum viable testing. But don't do two or three different coding challenges, there's no point. Consider this, other companies are hunting for the same candidates as you, and the company that offers first has an edge over the rest. Companies with a long and difficult process really are at a disadvantage. It also helps to keep the process flexible. Like we've seen, not all tactics are effective with every type of candidate, and some candidates require a bit more testing than others, those who are less experienced in particular. You can have a process template, but don't be afraid to bend it for every candidate. You could give them choices like testing versus a short contract or pairing exercise versus a take-home project,
so they can choose what they feel more comfortable with. Or skip the testing when they have public code that you can review. Also, don't be afraid to run experiments and A-B test alterations to your process to see what works best. And always keep it collaborative. Remember that the candidate is selecting you as much as you are selecting them. Keep it pleasant and relaxed and maintain the two-sided communication at all times. Remember the mantra, date rather than exam. And finally, don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's more realistic to be fault tolerant than to be fail proof. We've seen that making mistakes doesn't have to be a drama and it's definitely better than the alternative. In short, just make your process as agile as possible. And that's it. Thank you all very much for listening. Making all of this possible. Uh, it's yeah. been a pleasure for me. Yeah, go ahead, Duke. Thank you so much. And I really love the picture when you are taking the picture with the a Python, <laughs> a real Python. That's amazing. <laughs> so actually, there's a few questions I can mm -hmm. see in the chat because this is such a good talk. Uh, one second, let me hop Thank back you. into the chat. Yeah, so um, there are question about uh, the oops sorry my computer is playing up now <laughs> uh, okay so uh, okay do you know any company who does pair programming with the real world problem during their hiring process so I think I never experienced it but it's definitely doable like when I used to be the one training uh, newcomers when when they when they were recent hires uh, in, in the company. And the first thing uh, that I did was having a set of simple tickets that I would have pre-picked for, for them to do on, on their first day. And I think like something like this could be could be adapted to, to be done during hiring as well. Why not? And I do know some companies that 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 do the the full day at the job, which is a similar thing. They would they would show you a real ticket to do during that day. So it's it's the same thing. It's just a matter of time boxing it to an hour versus doing it during during a whole day. Yeah. So uh, actually, I, I have the same idea. I prefer uh, pair programming uh, in in the hiring process than uh, a, a challenge, especially like those challenge that you can find. You know, some company do that. There's some questions from the textbook and something. I think is uh, not very helpful. So, what's your opinion about about those? Like uh, those, uh, you know, coding challenges. Do you think it's a good idea? Or? Um. What, what colleague challenges exactly? Because there are many types. Like there's <laughs> like these platforms that do like math type algorithms and i think uh i think those are terrible like like i said uh, on the talk especially when they are on an automated platform because it's yeah. it's just so cold it's it's just you versus a machine and the feedback that you get is terrible the problem itself is very difficult to reason about and it's so detached from reality it's yeah. it's really you could get the same results by throwing a dice and saying, okay, this candidate goes on and this one doesn't because it's it's very much, there's a huge lack factor involved, as I said. But what about, uh, you know, coding challenge, but you know, you're online with the candidate, so they have to do it in front of you. Like, uh, what do you think about, like, is there more human touch in that? Or oh, is okay. Even yeah, I think or... that's that's equivalent to pairing. Like, it's it's, it's the remote equivalent to, pa to pairing. So instead of doing it on a, the two of you on a laptop, you two are connected and doing it at the same time. I think what is important is just to be there and reassure and guide the, ki the candidate while also uh, keeping an eye on, on their thought process and, and how they approach the problem. I think this is the, the, the most efficient way to, to do it. Yeah, I remember uh, one time I was interviewing and actually was told to uh, write on the uh, whiteboard instead of uh, just code, which, which is very good. But I think now COVID, the, the, that's the best thing you can get is to, you know, online be with the candidate. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. And it's, it's like, yes, thank you so much for the talk. And it's really, really interesting to see yeah. like how, you know, because uh, because most people, they, 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 they don't put too much thought in it. And it's a very yeah, important uh, thing. Even yeah. myself, like when we started interviewing, you just start doing what everyone else does without thinking. And it, really, if, if you think a little about the implications, you can make it much more efficient for everyone. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and it's good for the company as well, for the whole team, because you yeah, want to exactly. get someone you can work with rather than someone that you are struggling to, uh, you know, may not be a good fit for the team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really good. So uh, thank you so much. I think, uh, yeah, I, thanks yeah I think everybody is saying it's an excellent talk and uh, there's no more questions as far as <laughs> I know. But if people want to keep on dis discussing about this uh, important topic, of course, the breakout room is open. And yep. um, yeah, so thank you so much and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, same um, wise. Yeah, thank you. And now I think we are having a coffee break. Excellent.